Martin Luther was born November 10th, 1483, in the city of Eisnaden, Germany. The day after his birth was the feast of St. Martin, so his parents, Hans and Margarete, named him Martin. His father was a miner who worked in the copper mines of Mansfeld, where they had moved. And he came from peasant stock. He was successful enough to have started his own copper processing business and had a position among the leaders of the small town of Mansfeld in the year 1491. He was a common, working man who kind of made some success for himself in the business world, Martin Luther's father. Luther's few recollections of his childhood uh, that have survived reflect a somber piety and a strict discipline that was common at that age. His schooling seems to have been unremarkable. He went to the Latin school at Mansfeld, a year later to a school at Magdeburg, run by the Brethren of the Common Life. We've heard of them before, right? They were a medieval lay group dedicated to Bible study and education. And then he went to Eisenach in his 15th year, where he made valued older friends. When Luther was a boy at Eisenach, going to school there, he didn't uh, have a lot of money. And so he and his friends went about from house to house singing. And it's said that one wealthy family, uh, the woman of the house, was so impressed by Luther's singing that she sort of took him in and uh, he was made a part of the family there. Uh, the idea, in some people's mind, is that this is where Martin Luther learned some of his culture and his greater manners. There were many people in Luther's day who couldn't handle the fact that such a normal young man from such a peasant kind of family could have been used of God so mightily. So I think in some ways people wanted to overemphasize this connection that he had with the family that he met in Eisenach. Well, I'm sorry to say the name of this family immediately escapes me, but Luther certainly had some connection with them and lived at their home in Eisenach. Uh, but Martin Luther's father wanted a son, wanted his son, I should say, his son who was very intelligent to be a lawyer. So at age 18, that would be the spring of 1501, he went away to the University of Erfurt, now at that time, Erfurt had one of the oldest and most attended universities in Germany. They taught there, he taught long and seriously enough to be given the nickname, the philosopher. And he also learned how to play the lute, the uh, sort of medieval guitar. He distinguished himself in study, eventually earning a Master of Arts degree in a day when very few people went that far. And it was at Erfurt that Martin Luther, when he was 20 or 21 years old, that he saw his first Bible. He had never even seen a Bible before, before he was 20 or 21 years old. But as he read it, he was deeply stirred. Uh, for some reason, the story of Hannah and her little boy Samuel, especially the calling of Samuel, had a very deep impact on him. You see, like many other parents of his time, Hans Luther wanted something better for his own children than he had for himself. And so he wanted his son not to be a miner, not to be a laborer, but to be a lawyer. And so he paid cheerfully for the very expensive textbooks when Martin began his legal studies. But he was horrified to learn that his son, without consulting his parents, had decided to leave the University of Erfurt and go into the monastery of the Augustinian Hermits in, Hermits in Erfurt. How did that happen? Well, in 1505, when Luther was 22, he had just finished university, he was getting ready for his advanced legal studies. Several events spoke to him. First, a friend was killed in a fight. And Luther was struck with the question, well, what if that was me? You know, why wasn't it me and not my friend? What would happen if I should die? Secondly, one day as he was traveling, riding a horse, a dagger that he was carrying accidentally cut his leg and at least nicked a main artery. He bled seriously. And he cried out to the Virgin Mary for help, and he survived. But third, and perhaps most notably, 
as he was riding his horse near the village of Stotternheim, a severe thunderstorm frightened his horse, and his horse threw him. He fell to the ground in terror and cried out to Saint Anne, who was the patron saint of miners, and he vowed to become a monk if she would save him. So, he was saved, and he became an Augustinian monk, just at the time when he was establishing himself as one of the great young legal minds of Europe, Martin Luther turned his back on, his all, on it all and went to the monastery. Now, Martin Luther, even though he was a monk, he had a keen legal mind and a very strong sense of guilt before God. When he went to the monastery, he sat down with the leaders, they would counsel him, they would disciple him in the sort of routine that they had in the monastery for new people coming in. And he came under the leadership of his mentor uh, of the Augustinian order there in Erfurt, a man named Johann von Stauffitz. Now sometimes von Stauffitz would get frustrated when Luther would come to confession. Luther would come to confession reciting every trivial sin that he committed. Because for Luther, in his acute legal mindset, there was no such thing as a trivial sin. He would come and he would confess the smallest little things in his life. Confession with Martin Luther would go on for a long, long time. Once, Van Stoppitz became so frustrated with Luther in the confessional that he actually told him, he said, listen, go out and do some real sinning and then come back to me. But Luther's torment... Luther's, and there's a great word for it in German, Anfechtung. It means a sense of spiritual darkness and trial. Luther's spiritual Anfechtung was the result of three things. First, he had a good mind which could properly analyze things. Secondly, he knew that he was a sinner and that God was righteous. Third, he understood the idea of God's righteousness from medieval theologians and not from the Bible. You see that phrase, the righteousness of God, like many biblical terms, such as grace, faith, justification, and so on. That phrase, the righteousness of God, had been reinterpreted by medieval theologians of the high and late Middle Ages. Especially guys like Gabriel Beale, Don Scotus, Peter Lombard, Thomas Aquinas, they defined the righteousness of God in a way that supported a theology of law and works. You see, for centuries, the church taught that the righteousness of God was God's active, personal righteousness, or justice, by which He punished the unrighteous sinner. I've sinned, Oh man, I'm in trouble because of the righteousness of God. God is so righteous, so holy, so against sin, that the righteousness of God means that He will totally punish my sin. That was the teaching of these medieval theologians, these scholastic theologians, and it was what Martin Luther believed about the righteousness of God. This, Luther informs us, is what he had learned. Therefore, whenever he came across the phrase the righteousness of God in the Bible, it terrified me. It said, it struck my conscience like lightning, or it was like a thunderbolt in my heart, because he knew that he was an unrighteous sinner who fell very short of God's righteous or perfect demands. Therefore, curiously, even in the monastery, Luther felt anger and hatred towards God. This is what he said. I did not love, yes, I hated the righteous God who punishes sinners. You say, well, that's wicked, Luther. How could, you, how could you hate God? I'll tell you why he hated God. Because he felt that there was no answer. He felt that God had set up a system where Luther was undeniably and irredeemably corrupt, irredeemably unrighteousness, and when he came and encountered the righteousness of God, it didn't help him. It only condemned him further. Further, Luther used to murmur to God. He said, isn't it enough that God crushes us miserable sinners with his law, 
But now he threatens us with punishment through the gospel as well. So Luther tried to make himself righteous. He followed the general idea of the flagellants. Do you know who the flagellants were? They were a group of people beginning in the 12th and 13th century across Europe. Quite a movement, a lay movement among Roman Catholics where hundreds and hundreds of people at any given time would march through the streets of the city, would carry whips, and at certain times and at certain you know, <coughs> rhythm of prayers and such, they would whip their backs until they were bloody. They did this in an attempt to atone for their own sins. And, and they would do other punishments upon themselves. Basically, they would whip their backs with, with strong cords until they were bloody to demonstrate their own repentance, their own self-flagellation. So Luther went on a very strict program of fastings, self-beatings, and self-abasement. Luther said this, I was a good monk, and I kept to the rule of my order so strictly that I may say that if ever a monk got to heaven by his monkery, it would be I. All my brothers in the monastery who knew me will bear me out. If I had kept on any longer, I should have killed myself with vigils, prayers, reading, and other work. He said that he worked so hard at abasing himself and making himself righteous before God that he came close to death. This is what he says in his commentary on, the Galatians, on Galatians. He says, I crucified Christ daily in my cloistered life and blasphemed God by my wrong faith. Outwardly I kept myself chaste, poor, and obedient. I was much given to fasting, watching, praying, saying of masses, and the like. Yet under the cloak of my outward respectability, I continually mistrusted, doubted, feared, hated, and blasphemed God. My righteousness was as a filthy puddle. Satan loves such saints. They are his darlings, for they quickly destroy their body and soul by depriving them of the blessings of God's generous gifts. In another place he said, I tell you, I stood in awe of the Pope's authority. To descend from him, I considered it a crime worthy of, of eternal death. I thought of John Huss as a cursed heretic. I counted it a sin to even think of him. I would gladly have furnished the wood to burn him. I would have felt I had done God a real service. This was Luther's mentality. Totally Catholic, totally searching for righteousness with God, totally serious about his Christian life. In the year 1507, Martin Luther had said his first Mass. Now you understand what happens at the Mass, right? The priest presides over the bread and the cup being made the actual body and blood of Jesus Christ. And at the moment, when the priest says those words, in hoc signis, in hoc signis, in hoc corpus meum, in hoc signis vincis, that was Constantine, right? In the same concert. Uh, this is my body, in Latin, as soon as he says those words, the actual bread becomes the body of Christ and the priest holds in his hand the body of Jesus Christ. Uh, Luther was terrified of this. He was really embarrassing. He invited his father to come and watch. This was going to be his first mass. This was going to be sort of his ordination as a priest. And Luther utterly failed. He embarrassed himself. He embarrassed everybody else because he was so terrified in his conducting of the mass that everybody could see that this guy had some serious problems. In the year 1510, Luther visited Rome and was disillusioned by the kind of mechanical faith that he saw there. He did everything he could to please God. He even climbed up what were said to be Pilate's stairs, where supposedly Jesus walked in his trial before Pilate. It was said that if anybody crawled up this staircase on his bare knees, they would receive the forgiveness of sins. Luther prayed and kissed each step as he walked up. But even then, the whole scene gave him no peace, and his doubts were brewing. He said, I remember when I went to Rome, I ran about like a madman to all the churches, all the convents, all the places of note of every kind. I implicitly believed every tale about all of them that any uh, uh, poser had ever, ever invented. 
I said a dozen masses, and I almost regretted that my father and mother were not dead so that I might have availed myself of the opportunity to draw their souls out of purgatory by a dozen or more masses and other good works of similar description. We did these things then, knowing no better. It is in the Pope's interest to encourage such lies. That's not how he felt when he came to Rome. When Luther came to Rome, seeing the city from a distance, he dropped to his knees and cried out, Hail, holy Rome, three times holy for the blood of the martyrs shed there. But when he left the city, he was completely disillusioned, and he said this, If there is a hell, Rome is built over it. Later on, he said this, I would not have missed seeing Rome for a hundred thousand florins. I should have always felt an uneasy doubt whether or not I was doing injustice to the Pope. As it is, I'm quite satisfied that I've treated him fairly. So, he returned to Germany. And he, as a monk, he began his career as a professor of the Bible and as a Bible teacher in the city of Wittenberg. Now, compared to Erfurt, Wittenberg was small and unimportant. The university there was just beginning. And when he came to Wittenberg, one of the most important churches there was the Schlosskirche, that is the castle church. It was called the, the Church of All Saints and was closely connected with the university. And the elector of Saxony, a man named Frederick the III of the Wise, lavishly generous, lavishly, uh, lavish, I to say, generous patronage on both the church and the university. And so, Luther started teaching the Bible at Wittenberg. He was a gifted Bible teacher. At the university, he taught verse by verse through the Psalms, through Romans, through Galatians, and through Hebrews. His verse by verse teaching reflected a tremendous love of God's Word. You see, long before his work as a reformer, Luther fell in love with the Bible. At the beginning of the 16th century, that was anything but typical. But again, in our day, people are used to reading their Bible regularly. They're used to a devotional life uh, with the Bible. In Luther's day, at the beginning, it was not common at all. Because very few people were encouraged to read their Bibles. You see, what they knew about the Bible, they had just heard in church. But those who did have an access to a Bible were not especially encouraged to read it. The Bible was looked upon as a dark and obscure book, one that needed expert guidance to understand. Therefore, again, there's nothing unusual about Luther's claim that he never saw a Bible until he was 20 years old. And again... This was predominantly the attitude towards the Bible among many medieval theologians. It was entirely possible in the seminaries and universities of Luther's day for you to become a doctor of theology without studying the Bible at all. They felt that it was much more important that you study the medieval theologians than it was for you to study the Bible. But with all of this in view, Luther's love for the Bible was remarkable. He started loving the Bible in his very first year in the monastery. Because as a novice in the monastery, one of the things they do is they gave you a Bible. And Luther got that Bible. Now, he was only able to have it for a year, because after a year they would take the Bible from him and give it to other people. But Luther received that Bible. He said it was bound in a red leather cover, and he was encouraged to study. And Luther said later on, that he had read that Bible so thoroughly that he knew what was on every page of it. He said when a passage was mentioned, he knew immediately where to find it. He said no other study pleased him as much as learning the Bible. Unfortunately, at the end of his first year, they took the Bible from him and they gave it to somebody else. They thought, now you've had your year of the Bible, now you'll start studying some more serious things, some more <coughs> But again, Luther's love and passion for the Bible were unusual. His great appetite for the Word of God did not stop in the monastery. Looking back in the year 1532, this is what Luther said. He said, for some years now, I have read the Bible through twice every year. If you picture the Bible to be a mighty tree and every word a little branch, I have shaken every one of those little branches 
because I wanted to know what it meant. Luther was serious about his love for the Bible. And throughout his entire adult life, he read the Bible many, many times. He always felt that it should be understood. This is what he said in another place. He said, the neglect of Scripture, even by spiritual leaders, is one of the greatest evils in the world. Everything else, arts or literature, is pursued and practiced day and night. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and there is no end of labor and effort, but Holy Scripture is neglected as if there was no need of it. Those who condescend to read it want to absorb everything at once. There has never been an art or a book on earth that everyone has so quickly mastered as the Holy Scriptures, but its word or not as something mere literature, that is, lesevort. No, they are words of life, that is, lebevort. They are words of life intended not for speculation and fancy, but for life and action. But why complain? No one pays any attention to our lament. May Christ our Lord help us by His Spirit and love to honor His Holy Word with all our hearts. Amen. Again, Luther loved God's Word. But anyway, back to the year 1514. <clears throat> Luther was lecturing through the book of Psalms, and he came across a troubling text. Psalm 31.1. I'll read it to you. This is what it says. In you, O Lord, I put my trust. <clears throat> Let me never be ashamed... Deliver me in your righteousness. Now, Luther wondered at that because he had learned about the righteousness of God from the scholastic medieval theologians. And when he heard the righteousness of God, he was ready for that righteousness that would punish him, right? The righteousness which would condemn him. So when he read in Psalm 31, 1, Deliver me in your righteousness. It made no sense whatsoever. Listen, it deliver me in your righteousness. Your righteousness does nothing but condemn me, God. What am I to do with this? He thought it over and over again. He turned it over and thought about it, tried to connect it with other scriptural passages. And then instantly, what came into his mind was Romans 1.17. For in it, that is the gospel, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. When Luther came to understand the gospel in Romans 1, he was able to compare his discovery from the rest of scripture from memory, precisely because he had spent so many years reading and studying the Bible, and he sized it up, and he began to understand that his prior understanding of the righteousness of God was completely wrong. The righteousness of God, as it is in the New Testament, isn't the righteousness that condemns us, it's the righteousness that saves us. It's not the righteousness of a judge condemning his people, it's the righteousness of God as a Savior giving us His righteousness so that we can have His righteousness before Him. Luther says this, My situation was that, although I was an impeccable monk, I stood before God as a sinner troubled in conscience, and I had no confidence that my merit would satisfy Him. Night and day I pondered until I saw the connection between the justice of God and the statement, The just shall live by faith. Then I grasped the truth that the righteousness of God is that righteousness thereby, through grace and sheer mercy, He justifies us by faith. Therefore I felt myself to be reborn and gone through open doors into paradise. This passage of Paul became to me a gateway into heaven. By the way, in his translation of the Bible, Luther came to add the word alone to the word in faith. He used to say, for we hold that a man is justified by faith alone, apart from the works of the law. He felt that that word alone was demanded by the context. And Martin Luther passed from death unto life. I believe that this is where Martin Luther was actually born again. Where he realized, for the first time in his life, that the righteousness of God could be his by faith. A huge difference. Well, how did that connect with the Reformation? 
Well, again, as we said, in 1514, Luther was, the, Luther was the local church preacher and pastor in Wittenberg. He did this along with his responsibilities at the university. It was his heart as a pastor and his mind as a Bible teacher that started the controversy over the sale of indulgences. Now again, let me say a little bit about indulgences. In Roman Catholic thinking, there are two penalties for every sin. There's the spiritual penalty, and there's the temporal penalty. In other words, there's the spiritual one, and then there's the, you know, current punishment. The priest can forgive you of the spiritual penalty of your sin, but you have to deal with the temporal penalty of sin yourself. The idea is that every sin has inescapable consequences. When you buy an indulgence, basically what you're doing is buying penance, a good deed. I don't know if any of you come from Catholic backgrounds, you ever went to confession, and the Pope told you to go say ten Hail Marys and five Our Fathers. But basically, buying an indulgence is a financial way of saying Hail Marys, or going on a pilgrimage, or anything else. It wasn't until the 11th century that indulgences were given to relax the temporal penalty of sin on the condition that the money be given to build a church or a monastery. Then the practice of granting indulgences for money became more and more prominent with the advent of the Crusades. Beginning with the first crusade in 1095, Pope Urban II promised the remission of penance on all who fought in the crusade to liberate the Holy Land. And later, this was extended to those who simply supported the Crusades with money. In the year 1343, the sale of indulgences was endorsed, endorsed by a church decree. Here's the church decree. Now this treasure is not hidden in a napkin, nor buried in a field, but he entrusted it to be helpfully dispensed through blessed Peter, bearer of heaven keys, and his successor as vicars on earth. To the faithful for fitting and reasonable causes, now for total, now for partial remission of the temporal punishment of sins. And to this heap of treasure, the merits of the blessed mother of God, and of all the elect, from the first just man to the last, are known to have supplied their increment. You know how I talked before about the church being a bank of grace? Well, you might ask, if the church is like a bank of grace, who makes the deposits into the bank of grace? Well, they would say the Holy Mother of God, although I wouldn't use that phrase definitely, but they would say the Virgin Mary makes the deposits into the bank of grace, and the saints, because the saints were actually better than they had to be to get to heaven. And so their excess goodness is put into the bank of grace. Basically, the idea is that the Pope can dispense indulgences from the bank of grace as it pleases him, that's what this uh, church decree declared. Now, in the year 1476, it was decreed that indulgences could be granted to the dead to help release a soul from purgatory. It really happened because the popes needed money to finance their wars in Italy and their other wars here and there and their gra uh, grand building projects. So they turned to selling indulgences as a way to raise money. And so, uh, because uh, different people bought benefices and bought church offices and had to pay the money back, there was actually a very interesting uh, arrangement with a guy named Albert of Brandenburg. He purchased various parishes and bishoprics in Germany in the early years of the 16th century. And in 1513, he made an agreement with Leo X to sell indulgences in his land. By a secret agreement, half the money went to pay off the debt that he incurred in buying his parishes, and the other half went to the Pope for rebuilding St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. So Albert chose a man named John Tetzel. Tetzel was a Dominican monk, and he was chosen to sell the indulgences. Tetzel was a great salesman and marketer. His slogan was, As soon as the money in the basket rings, the soul from purgatory springs. Tetzel used to do elaborate sort of, of demonstrations at churches. They would come to a church, basically take over the Sunday morning service, 
and really use a lot of drama and a lot of powerful preaching to convince people to buy indulgences. Tetzel used to say things like this, listen to the voices of your dear dead relatives and friends begging you and praying, saying, pity us, pity us, we are from dire, we are in dire torment that you can deliver us from for just a little bit of money. Don't you want to deliver us? That's the kind of shtick that Tetzel did all around the place. When the indulgent salesmen went to town, they'd set up inside the local church, and once they were there, uh, regular preaching was suspended and forbidden, and they actually have these indulgent sermons where they would say these kinds of things. Now, how much did these indulgences cost? Well, it depended on one's station in life. A, a king or a queen would have to pay 25 goldens, high counts and prelates 10 goldens, low counts and prelates 6 goldens, merchants and townspeople 3 goldens, artisans 1 golden, others half a golden, and if you were totally poor, you could get it for free, you just had to promise to fast and pray. But at the same time, even though a lot of people bought these indulgences, the indulgence sellers were not popular. They were sometimes attacked and strung up in the town square because people had the sense that they were being ripped off. Now, Tetzel worked the territory right next to where Martin Luther was a professor and a parish priest. He objected to the work of Tetzel because his thought his people were getting ripped off. And so he did the customary thing. First of all, he absolutely forbade his people from going to Tetzel. He, let me back up. He forbade Tetzel from coming into his territory. You know, Luther was a pastor over a diocese. And he said, you can't come into my territory, Tetzel. But what Tetzel did was he just set up camp in the neighboring territory. And many of Luther's people in his church were going over and wasting their money on these indulgences. And that made Luther mad. So what did he do? He proposed to begin a scholarly debate on the practice of selling indulgences. So he wrote out 95 statements in Latin, calling into question the theology and the practice of selling indulgences, and he sent these 95 statements to his bishop, to the Archbishop of Mainz, and to other religious and intellectual leaders. It's also said that he posted these 95 theses on the church door of the Castle Church in Wittenberg. Now, actually, I want you to know that there's some historical question as to if Martin Luther ever actually nailed them to the church door in Wittenberg. I know we love the picture of Luther, you know, boldly nailing them to the door and such, but there's some question as to whether or not he ever did it. And the question is this. Luther never talked about it in his own day. Luther never mentioned once, hey, remember the time when I nailed those 95 theses to the church door in Wittenberg? He never said that. It was only mentioned once. Now, it was mentioned by a reliable guy, Philip of Melanchthon, Luther's successor. So, mentioned by a reliable guy, we tend to take it as true, but we would prefer that Luther himself would have said it, or there would have been more contemporary mention of it. We know this for sure. Martin Luther wrote out the 95 Theses, and he mailed them to these different religious leaders on October 31st, 1517. We know that he did that. But it's a lot more dramatic to think of Luther nailing it to the church door than it is to see him dropping a letter to a mailbox. And so this is the image that is stuck in anybody's mind. Now, it was not unusual for Luther to do this if he did do it, because the church door could be sort of like a bulletin board where people would post things up that were for discussion or debate, and Luther was merely inviting a scholarly debate upon this issue. By the way, it also made sense for him to do it on October 31st, because the next day was All Saints Day, and many people would come to the castle church, the Schlosskirche, to see the famous relic collection of Frederick the Wise, which was displayed once a year on that day. You see, inside the castle church on November 1st, All Saints Day, were seven aisles full of relics, 
which would be the bones of saints and other supposedly holy items that would be adored on All Saints Day. Frederick the Wise was very high on relics. His castle church housed 19,000 pieces that were said to be worth more than 1,900,000 days of indulgence. The relic collection of Frederick the Wise included a piece of the burning bush, soot from the fiery furnace, some of Mary's mother's milk, and a piece of Jesus' crib, just to name a few. In any regard, whether or not Luther actually nailed it to the church doors, or whether he just wrote it out and posted it to people, copies were printed and spread throughout Germany and all of Europe incredibly quickly. Now it's important to say that Martin Luther was not the only one of his time to question indulgences. Many people throughout Europe had complained and were complaining about them. This explains in part why the theses spread so rapidly and found such enthusiastic support. Luther was the first one to think through a scriptural response to the practice of selling indulgences, or at least the first one to do it so thoroughly. Now, what was Luther expecting when he did this? He expected that the Pope would side with him when he saw what was happening with the selling of indulgences. Luther basically said this, what Johann Tetzel and the sellers of indulgences are doing is an outrage. I'm sure the Pope would be outraged as well if he only saw what was happening. That was Luther's attitude. And so he decided that he would inform the Pope of this, that he would start a scholarly debate, and he would start getting the issue discussed up through the channels, eventually to the papal hierarchy. Let's take a look at some of Luther's 95 theses. Number 26. The Pope does well in giving remission to souls, not by the power of the keys, he has no such power, but through intercession. Now can you see right there, that's a pretty big slap in the face to medieval papal thinking right there. What statement is the slap in the face? He has no such power as the keys. That's a big statement. Now, Luther says, oh, the, the Pope can get people out of purgatory, but he can do it through his intercession, not through his keys. Number 27, those who assert that a soul straight away flies out of purgatory as a coin tinkles in the collection box are preaching an invention of man. Number 28, it is sure that when a coin tinkles, greed and avarice are increased but the intercession of the church is in the will of God. Number 36. Every Christian who is truly contrite has plenary remission, of sin, remission, both of penance and guilt, as is his due, even without a letter of pardon from the Pope. You see what he's saying there? He's saying that, listen, um, you don't need a letter of pardon from the Pope to be truly forgiven your sins. If you're sincerely repentant, you can be forgiven your sins. A few more. Number 54. A wrong is done to the Word of God when in the same sermon an equal or longer time is devoted to indulgences than to God's Word. Number 82. They, that is the laity, ask, Why does not the Pope empty purgatory on the account of most holy charity and the great need of souls? The most righteous of causes, seeing that he redeems an infinite number of souls on account of sordid money, given for the erection of a basilica, which is a most trivial cause. This is pretty heavy. And this shows that, that Luther, even in these early years, was not entirely friendly to the Pope and the papacy, right? This is a fairly hostile statement. It says, you know what? If the Pope can empty out purgatory, if he has that power to deliver a soul from purgatory, then why doesn't he just do it out of love? Right? Why does he demand money before he'll do it? It would seem to me, Luther would say, that the Pope should just do it out of a loving impulse. Number 86. The Pope's riches at this day far exceed the wealth of the richest millionaires, Cannot he therefore build one single basilica of St. Peter out of his own money, 
rather than out of the money of the faithful poor? Ooh. Uh, it's a fancy church, a cathedral. And finally, number 93, and so farewell to all those prophets who say to Christ's people, the cross, the cross, and there is no cross. You can see where these 95 theses were pretty much in the face of a lot of Roman Catholic thinking and the hierarchy. And it took a lot of courage for Luther to do this. He didn't expect for a moment that it was going to start the widespread firestorm that it did. But even for him to think about, I'm going to raise the debate in these terms, just in my sleepy little city of Wittenberg, it still took a lot of courage for Martin Luther to do that. You see, the bottom line on indulgences was forgiveness. And the power of the Pope to grant forgiveness. Luther insisted that all the Pope could do was declare a person forgiven by God if God had already forgiven them. In other words, if God had forgiven you, the Pope could say you are forgiven them. Luther did not believe that the Pope could grant forgiveness for sins except for sins that had been committed against him personally, right? What right does the Pope have to forgive somebody else who never sinned against him? This was a big attack against the idea of the almost unlimited power that the Pope had. But I should say Germany specifically and Europe in general was very ready for just such an attack. So, John Tetzel died in the year 1519. He was a disgraced and broken man, but Martin Luther was just getting started with 